to give you a context of the project, uh, it's located in the northeasternmost corner of India, uh, tucked between mainland India and Southeast Asia. Uh, you know, the project sort of took place uh, on one of the major rivers of South Asia called Brahmaputra. Uh, it flows somewhere in Tibet, uh, going down all the way across the plains of Assam, draining into the Bay of Bengal, joined by the Ganges here. So all three stages of the project sort of took place in the city of Guwahati on the southern bank of the state of Assam in northeast India. So uh, these are really questions and initiations and not finite entities. Um, questions like, uh, how can we create a sense of belongingness in a place with people at the core? And how can I bring my love for the concepts of genius loci, placemaking, creative placemaking, uh, vernacular architecture, landscape, etc., together to create a, a sense of community and a sense of place? So the river and this whole idea of a journey are cultural icons um, that uh, represent the identity of this place to me. Uh, as an artist, I see the river as a fluid space that offers a lot of uh, entry points for exploring multiple realities, lives, memories, and cultural identities. So uh, the project sort of took the shape of this uh, discursive space, as I call it, a floating uh, space on the river that offered uh, opportunities for, uh, you know, convergence of disciplines, ideas, people um, over a period of time. And it also sought to become um, a, a circumstance uh, for, you know, creating a different alternate way of experiencing the environment. So the project has used uh, ideas in placemaking. Placemaking, as we know, is a multifaceted approach to design of public spaces that originated in the 60s. Um, you know, placemaking is uh, transformative, it's all-inclusive, it bo it's bottoms up, it's uh, community-oriented, it's collaborative, and all of those things. And uh, this project has also used uh, you know, ideas uh, of creative placemaking. And creative placemaking is when you strategically shape the physical and the social character of a place utilizing arts and cultural activities. So I uh, quickly want to talk about this um, medieval placemaker who was born in um, India. Um, he, I see him as a Renaissance man. His, his name is Srimanta Shankardev. He's a polymath, placemaker, saint scholar, poet, playwright, socio-religious reformer, all sort of rolled into one. Uh, interestingly, he was working around the same time as Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was working at the intersection of the science uh, and arts, and uh, Srimanta Shankardev was kind of drawing upon the intersection of art and culture. Uh, and he's uh, credited with building upon past relics to come up with new forms of performance, theater, music, and a whole new form of language. Uh, and his idea sort of evolved physically into these uh, uh, cultural markers. I call them nodes of culture. Uh, they're called satras in the local terminology. Um, they're like monasteries of culture that are strewn all across the region. They sort of became these platforms for bringing the interdisciplinary arts together in a um, very hybrid way. So um, a little bit about my background. I've been drawing upon my background in visual arts, architecture, and cultural studies to sort of search for this um, uh, interdisciplinary practice, um, almost like taking parts of each of these disciplines and repositioning them in a space of ambiguity to shed sort of new light uh, on each of these disciplines for myself, it was a sort of a personal exploration as well. So I was looking at, you know, picking parts of visual arts and architecture, and I was using cultural studies as a linkage between visual arts and architecture to make this uh, interdisciplinary practice, as I call it, more uh, critically engaged. For instance, in visual arts, I was looking at the intersection of painting, ecology, space, architecture. Um, in architecture, I was working with uh, culturally and uh, environmentally responsive, responsive buildings. Uh, this uh, is uh, Shigeru Ban's work. Uh, some of you who have been very inspired by you probably know Shigeru Ban. is a Japanese international architect who um, is 
most known for his work with recycled paper tubes that he's used for humanitarian purposes. His work really blurs the boundaries between architecture, art, and social practice. And I particularly like the way he has used uh, basketry patterns in his work. And Ooh. cultural studies, when it comes to cultural studies, um, it's about my research at the University of Oregon where I was looking at vernacular uh, sort of patterns um, in certain parts of Northeast India and comparing, contrasting them with parts of Southeast Asia. Uh, and with this premise that this whole uh, region, despite political boundaries, comprise one geopolitical entity. And this is really, during this research, is really when my interest in placemaking, vernacular context, and uh, working with local materials began. So all these ideas sort of coalesce together in a series of interventions in the public realm. And uh, you know the idea of challenging the traditional boundaries between arts and crafts, artist artisan, public private, inside outside, and <coughs> the uh, idea sort of started to take the shape of so a social practice, you know, socially engaged arts um, that uh, was also trying to create this participatory public art uh, in the public realm, uh, creating a space for that and creating a space for interdisciplinary convergence of different uh, disciplines, people, and ideas. So um, the pro three stages of the project have project has transpired. Uh, stage one took place in 2011 and 12, and the subsequent stages sort of built upon the previous stage. So I just completed stage three in 2014. But the first stage uh, was really about delving deeper into the craft forms or cultural forms as I've been talking about, borrowing the terminology from the field of anthropology. Um, the, uh, the, you know, I was doing a lot of sketching and studies, um, trying to extract value from bamboo, which is a vernacular material of that region, and uh, asking questions like, what happens when you take away the meaning and the function of certain forms, and uh, what can be reclaimed? And can the reclaim become uh, a catalyst for new meanings and reimaginations? So uh, what I started doing was, uh, I started working in the public realm, uh, and I started collaborating with the community. In this case, this was a group of uh, bamboo master craftsmen. And um, you know, uh, we created a series of site-specific installations in the public realm using kinzai strips of bamboo. Uh, trying to evoke uh, local craftsmanship, and also trying to sort of push the boundaries of form and technique. Um, uh, being a painter, I was also interested in sort of uh, creating a gestural abstraction in real time and space. Um, the idea was also about uh, magnifying scale, you know, looking at basketry and magnifying scale and distorting geometry and sort of creating whimsy. Uh, also working on smaller cultural forms or craft forms, as I call them, um, you know, basketry, fish traps, and trying to sort of uh, look at them in a totally new way, converting them from uh, functional objects to non-objects and forms, um, creating abstractions out of them. So the uh, transparent utilitarian objects <coughs> sort of became pure solid forms of geometry, color, space, and line. So being in the public realm offered this uh, amazing opportunity to uh, pull in people you know, in the publics uh, who were not from the uh, art world, so to speak, you know, from the non-art world. Uh, and you know, it led to spontaneous conversations and reactions. And, and through my conversations with the publics, I did get the feeling that they, uh, you know, there was this sense of looking at their own cultural capital in an inherently new way and looking at it more critically. So the second stage of the project, you know, kind of built upon the first stage and became a much larger uh, initiative where it uh, transpired into this sort of a floating uh, uh, space, a raft-like structure. Uh, a, a bamboo uh, floating structure was conceptualized and created, uh, inspired by the folklore and the sustainable principles surrounding these vernacular raft, uh, you know, rafts that have floated down the river. Um, so it was conceptualized as a visual performance art space or a sustainable habitat uh, that could be anchored like a boat or a ferry. And, um, and using this, uh, two collective cultural journeys were launched on the river. 
to sort of explore this whole idea of journey as a performance and also to initiate a dialogue on creative approaches with which communities can coexist with the environment. Um, I'll quickly go through you know, four basic conceptual ideas that I've used to um, you know, create the conceptual frameworks for all the stages. The idea of social sculpture, as you all know, borrowed from Joseph Bias. Um, this whole idea of art, uh, this expanded role of art, um, the cultural, um, environmental, and political function of art beyond just creating a piece of artwork. The idea of the itinerant bard, the, uh, the floating structure was reimagined as the itinerant bard of the river, you know, sort of evoking the wanderer in each one of us. And then the idea of the sustainable habitat, you know, evoking these temporary mobile um, universal vernacular habitats around the world with minimal environmental impacts. And this whole idea of the collective cultural journey being um, you know, trying to explore this idea of a journey as performance and also a, a collective journey as transformational. So throughout this project, there was this sort of a tension between the, the practical and the aesthetic, the symbolic uh, and, and the practical, the intellectual and the practical, I would say. Um, and it, it was a strain that carried throughout the project. This was the creation of the structure um, that involved collaborative work between artists, artisans, designers, architects, uh, and the idea for bringing on board people uh, from different disciplines with their own knowledge systems was to sort of uh, create an unanticipated convergence of disciplines and also to see where boundaries blur between various disciplines. Uh, through workshops, um, you know, the project was able to galvanize a community of uh, filmmakers, artists, artisans, uh, movement artists, photographers, you know, a host of people. Uh, it's like a loose collective, uh, totally non-hierarchical, and we hope to, you know, keep engaging in the future. And um, so the floating um, structure, the raft structure, as I call it, uh, as a piece of public art was able to generate this very sensor-free means of contact with the community, um, uh, creating, you know, opening up uh, different ways of uh, experiencing the environment. It was used as a gathering space, as a community space, as a space for impromptu cultural concerts, and, uh, and as a landmark for creating photographic memories, uh, generating alternative ways of interacting with the urban space. Um, so the first collective cultural journey was launched in 2013. Uh, during the journey, the structure and the collective journey became an arena for impromptu sort of uh, impromptu performances between performers who came together to engage in storytelling, dance performance, lecture performance, um, uh, and, and all these performances were structured around certain, you know. Uh, ideas, certain environmental, artistic, and cultural ideas uh, and frameworks that reflected the uh, diverse interests of the collectives and the performers on board. So the collective cultural journey, you know, uh, was a process of slowing down. Uh, it was the slowest journey uh, everybody had ever undertaken, and um, it was a process of trying to listen to the environment uh, and also. Uh, you know, it reflected this very non-linear, open-ended, uh, pluralistic uh, uh, method that was uh, part of the whole project. It tried to, the journey kind of was a space uh, that tried to break hierarchies between different classes of people by bringing them all together in collective performances and collective storytelling. So in its anchored state, um, the floating structure was able to again pull in people from, uh, you know, the non-art world. Uh, not only the typical gallery visitor or the art lover, but all kinds of people uh, and publics uh, through a series of thought-provoking events, experiences, and spaces. Uh, this was the last stage, the third stage of the project um, that kind of deepened the ideas of socially engaged arts and social practice as it's called, um, this was an initiative called Exploring Identities, where um, a prominent 
an artist, a folklorist, uh, installation artist, and a teacher brought together about <coughs> 30 students from various um, arts colleges, arts and crafts colleges, collectives, and organizations to converge on the floating space to uh, experiment with a performance installation piece where um, the idea was to generate interest amongst artists, publics, about the condition of the river, and also to start a dialogue on making our um, public spaces, riverfronts, uh, more accessible and safe. Uh, besides environmental concerns, they also explored issues of personal and collective identities, uh, which are uh, really relevant topics in the context of this region. So there was this other initiative. So these are a series of initiatives that were launched in the uh, third stage of the project that uh, you know, took up various ideas and tried to expand on them. This was called the tree line at the edge of arts and crafts that galvanized a group of artists and artisans to collaborate together uh, on the three-dimensional space of the raft itself and trying to transform it uh, by using a series of paintings and prints you know, trying to translate those prints and paintings into a three-dimensional space. Um, and then the question of how do you infuse a space in, public, in the public realm with meaning? Um, you know, uh, an interdisciplinary event uh, was organized that brought together the visual arts aspects, the performance aspects, uh, the poetry, there was a poetry performance, um, uh, and together we tried to sort of create this uh, interdisciplinary event to infuse meaning into the space. Uh, this another initiative tried to create a performance-based work set at the uh, you know, riverfront, at the urban space. Uh, there's this movement artist named Shir Pikashi uh, was working on this endangered island called Majuli. Uh, upstream, she kind of conceptualized this whole performance based on that <coughs> island, and she brought the stories of that island into uh, and adapted it to the uh, you know space or floating space of the raft and the riverfront, and uh, this was the first time that the pro proscenium piece was adapted to the uh, floating space of the raft. So then there's this um, another initiative called reimagining the ordinary, where we try to expand beyond the river itself and engage with the city you know, the urban, different urban spaces of the city. And in this, um, it translated into an urban walk uh, led by a group of poets and writers who um, used uh, literature, literary metaphors, and autobiography uh, to engage with sites of personal um, history and also to critically engage with uh, sites of colonial history. Um, and the idea was to use the walk as a tool, as an informal tool to uh, you know, to uh, generate an alternative way with it, of engaging with urban spaces in the city. Uh, the, collect the second collective cultural journey became a platform for our sound-based uh, project, sound-based exper uh, experiments, non-linear uh, experiments that you know explored sounds of the environment, sounds, uh, environmental sounds, work sounds, and various uh, everyday rhythms. Um, and I have the soundtrack, you know, it translated into a soundtrack and hopes to become the start of a much larger project to document everyday rhythms across the region. Again, here I wanted to point out this tension between the physical and the intellectual components of the project. So this was a short sort of one day initiative that brought together the idea of social sculpture, um, you know, brought back the idea of social sculpture using this very basic uh, element, the bamboo bowl that in, uh, formed one of the initial inspirations for the project. Another uh, uh, site-specific performance initiative that engaged uh, with a historical site, uh, it tried to revitalize uh, an archaeological, a passive archaeological site uh, by uh, using a site-specific performance uh, by uh, engaging with the historical and the archaeological narratives of the site. Uh, it also uh, led to an impromptu sound experiment, you know, a series of sounds came out of it that we uh, in, uh, incorporated in the sound-based project. So, uh, you know, there are more questions now as, as I'm uh, still thinking about the project, taking a step back, uh, working on it, you know, I'm thinking about 
how to expand, keep expanding on the project as a social catalyst, uh, to use it for further you know, transformations, uh, if I can use that word, and how to use a kind of a decentralized regional approach to uh, tap into a community's assets, potential, and inspirations uh, to continue to build community. And um, it takes time for a community to begin to become participants in a socially engaged project like this. Uh, and uh, and how, to, how do I sustain those long-term relationships and those valuable community networks as I think about uh, this project in the long, in the long term? And, and also, how do I evaluate the sustained value of a, a socially engaged project like this? Uh, the, you know, the value of the communal relationships, the community activities, and the processes take time to come to the fore. So how do I you know, sort of evaluate uh, the value of that? And personally, I would like the project to um, take a leap from all the artistic experimentations into the realm of social innovation. Um, uh, and to sort of start engaging with some of the more, some of the real uh, social and environmental challenges, um, and also to look, start looking at, uh, looking at bamboo in a deeper way. Look at the design, uh, conceptual, technical, <coughs> physical, uh, you know, um, potential of bamboo as a rapidly renewable resource, and also to start engaging with the aesthetic and the technical challenges. When it comes to the crafts, the artisanal community, design, and working with vernacular materials um, that were held, you know, that came through this uh, project, and also integrating the cultural and environmental initiatives into more of a, an urban art program, if possible, uh, and also to kind of get into research in a deeper way to start looking at the processes and frameworks of uh, working with communities and understanding the complexities of working with uh, you know, socially engaged projects like this. So these are some of the things um, I'm, uh, you know, I've been thinking about as the project continues to evolve. And sorry, that was the last slide. So anyways, uh, I'm done, right? <laughs>